Really, these three days have been directed towards setting our hearts about the souls of men. How many of you wrote down the names of three, four, five, six people yesterday at the conclusion of chapel? Would you raise your hand? I want you to, at this moment, I want you to turn to somebody sitting next to you. I do not want you to talk about anything but those names. I want you to turn to them and say, I am praying for the salvation of... And then I want you to tell that person sitting next to you the names that you wrote down. If you did not write any names, I want you to be honest and say, I didn't write any, but I'm planning to. Or if you did not write any and you're not planning to, that you'd say that. And just be honest and say, hey, I'm praying for these people. Or I didn't write somebody down and I'm planning to, or I did not and I'm not. So right now, turn to somebody and say, I wrote down or I'm praying for the salvation of... Please take your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, verse 13, it says that for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We see a promise. We see that this promise has a responder. Whosoever requirement shall call result saved. We see the prerequisites. Really, for them to believe, they must hear. And for them to hear, we must preach. And for us to preach, we must go. Would you pray with me? I want you to close your eyes. I want you to pray once again for these three, four, five, six people. It could be a mom, brother, co-worker, friend that you went to public school with kid you went to Christian school with that's drifted, I want you right now to close your eyes and pray once again for these people. Lord, help us to see this world from your eyes. God, we get busy. We get distracted. We get self-focused. We let our fear reign. We let worldliness drip into our soul. Lord, you've heard our prayer. God, I pray that at least half of this student body will the next two weeks be faithful to share Christ with one of these people that they wrote down on their list. And by God's grace, that, Father, that they would seize the opportunity to daily pray for the salvation of these folks. As Jesus told us to pray, therefore, the Lord, the harvest, that he bring forth laborers into his harvest. Father, thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Do you realize that evangelization or evangelism is more than just a presentation? It's really the overflow of a heart. You see, the woman at the well, she quickly told all of the men in the village and the people of the village what Jesus Christ had done in her heart. The the demon, uh, demoniac of Gadara, he goes back and he wants to share with everyone he can. You see, evangelism is more than just a presentation. In fact, if I was to talk to many of you, you could in fact tell me much of what is needed to share Christ. You could stumble your way through the Romans road. You could find a gospel track, a bridge track. You could find another track and you could walk somebody through it. I'm one of the best soul winners I ever knew was a man by the name of Kyle Sullivan. He'd been saved for just a few short months and he's sharing Christ. He didn't go through Christian school like some of us did. He wasn't homeschooled. He didn't grow up in a church that preached Jesus Christ. He grew up as a Catholic, yet at two months he was sharing Christ. Why? Because evangelism is more than just a presentation. It's the overflow of your life. A believer who's reading the Word, a believer who's seeking God's face in prayer, a believer who's enjoying walking in the Spirit, 
is a believer who will be sharing Christ. They will look for ways to build redemptive relationships. You see, it is true that sometimes we're to be light. We're to go and just share Christ wherever we go. A gospel track out of the hands. A, a quick verbal presentation from the lips. And perhaps going door to door. And perhaps we are to be light, but many times we're called to be salt as well. And where we're building redemptive relationships. But let's be honest. Some of us, we don't have any relationships with people that are lost. We don't know anybody in a personal way because some of the weaknesses of our conservative culture is that really we look around at the lost and if we're not careful, we can cast a judgmental eye. We can look at them as people we need to separate from. But truly, we're to be people that we are going after with redemptive relationships, building relationships and rapport for an opportunity to share Christ. And sharing Christ for the average Christian, is as simple as three things. Know your own personal story. Know your testimony. Know how it is that you came to Christ. Are you different? You see, know your story, but then know the Scriptures. Take the time to learn and to make a map and go through the Romans road, starting in Romans 3.23 or Romans 3.10, and talk about how that we're all sinners and talk about the penalty of sin in Romans 6.23. And go to the fact that Jesus Christ paid the price, Romans 5, 8. And then come to the scripture that we're at now, Romans 10, 13. Map out your scriptures. Take the time. If this Christmas, on your break, you get a Xbox 360 and some new games, you will take the time to know how to play that game. You will take the time, perhaps, to stumble through the game and open up the manual and then read through that game and the different nuances. You'll go online. Look up here, please. You'll go online and get cheat codes. You'll go online and get hints. Because you'll care about mastering that game. And it's time for some of us to care about mastering the scriptures that are associated with the gospel. But you know what? Know your story. Know the Scriptures. But know your Savior. I want everyone to look up here. Do you know why we are in a sorry state in sharing Christ? Because many of us just don't love Jesus. The fires of our personal walk are at an ebb. The passion to know Christ and fellowship with Him in suffering is low. You see, know your story, know the Scriptures, but know your Savior. And I believe as we look at this passage of Scripture that it's time for us to remember how great the promise of our salvation is and remember how great our responsibility is to the lost. The promise is, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I want you to scroll back the hour, scroll back the week, scroll back the time. And I want you to remember when you ask Jesus Christ to be your Savior, the text tells us there's a responder, that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. There's no difference between the Jew or the Greek, Romans 10, 12. John the Baptist looked up and saw Jesus and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which cometh to take away the sins of the world. The verse that we know and the verse that the Reference we see in many football games, John 3.16. For God so loved the world. I want you right now to look at Clearwater. I want you to peel back your eyes. I want you to pray that God would give you a heavenly vision about people. I want you to see that person at Starbucks. I want you to see that person you work with. I want you to see that one that you know that lives next door to you back in your hometown in Pennsylvania. I want you to see that the Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. In Peter, we learn that the Lord is not willing that any should perish. I want you to see with heavenly eyes their soul. Peel back the selfishness. Push back the slothfulness. And see their soul which will last for all of eternity. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. You see, the requirement is that they call. The call is an, it's admitting a need for help. 
The whole idea of the text behind that verse is the whole idea of one who is calling out because they have no, a hope nowhere else. To, to call is to admit a need for help. I was sharing Christ with a small boy who was the son of one of my friends, and he asked me to. I asked him, have you ever lied before? And this little boy said, oh, I've lied. I said, is lying a sin? He goes, oh, yes, lying is a sin. I said, so therefore, are you a sinner? He goes, oh, no, I'm not a sinner. You see, to call out means that you come to a place that you realize you need help. Like one 17-year-old boy at the end of a service, I said, what did you think about the service about Jesus Christ? He said, it was great, but I don't really see the need for Jesus. I said, well, let me ask you a question. Have you ever sinned? He goes, I, I don't know. I said, well, have you ever lied? He goes, of course I've lied. Everyone's lied. I said, well, I'm not talking about everyone. I'm just talking about you. No, so, uh, yeah, I've lied. I said, have you ever stolen anything? He goes, oh, no, I have never stolen anything in my entire life. I said, come on, you just told me you're a liar. I'm sure you stole something. He goes, oh, okay, I've stolen something. Said, have you ever looked on a woman and lust in your heart? Because we learned the law that you're not supposed to commit adultery. But Jesus said, whosoever shall look upon a woman and lust in the heart of the committed adultery already. He goes, come on, I'm a guy. I'm sure I, I, everyone's gone and done that. And I said, I'm not talking about everyone. Have you ever? And he goes, yeah. So I said, you're, so you're an adulterer of the heart. He goes, well, I don't like to think of it that way. I said, have you ever hated anybody? He goes, oh man, there's one guy I just cannot stand. I said, so Jesus Christ said that thou shalt not commit murder, but this I say unto you, that whoso shall hate his brother without a cause is in danger of the same judgment. So I said, you're a liar, a thief, an adulterer, and a murderer of the heart. He said, man, I'm kind of bad. I said, that's what I'm trying to tell you. Do you realize that every single one of us was born with sin in our heart? Every single one of us was born with a selfishness, a rebellion, and a pride in our soul. To call is an admitting of your need for help. Have you ever come to the place where you saw that you were a sinner? You see, even in a student body this size, a student body of 550, guess what? It could be that you've gone through the motions You've gone through the religion. You've gone through the smiling. You've gone through the conformity. You're going through a, a Christian college without getting too many demerits or too, many, uh, 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 too much trouble. But guess what? Just because you conform does not mean you ever came to a place that you realized you were a sinner. Because a call is admitting a need for help, but a call is directed to the only one who can help. And you know who that is? Jesus Christ. It is so good for us to go back to that time that we ask Jesus to be our Savior, because when we start to meditate on and we remember how great Jesus Christ's salvation is, we want to share it with other people. You see, if there's no passion in our heart to share Christ with others, it's because we've forgotten really what Christ has done for us, because really this treasure that we have is in earthen vessels, and if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. And we're to take that vessel of our earthen treasure with all of its coins and pull it down and throw it down and let the coins of our soul, the coins of our life, the coins of our gospel be dis dispensed to those that are spiritually poor. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes on the Father but by me. Look at me. We walked our way through half of the world's population yesterday. We went through India. We went through the Muslim countries. We went through Asia. Can I tell you something? If they hear not of Jesus Christ, if they do not trust in Jesus alone, they will spend eternity in hell. Did you hear me? Your neighbor, if they do not trust in Christ, will spend eternity in hell. Your coworker. Your relative, your cousin. I have an uncle that I've been sharing Christ with for many years. First time when I was five years old, I walked up to Uncle Maury. I said, Uncle Maury, would you please be saved? And he looks at me, and I don't know why he told a five-year-old this, but he looked at me and he said, Will, I can't wait to go to hell to party with my friends. Hell is no party. 
You see, it really is a time where we are required to call because a call admits a need for help. A call is directed to the only one that can help. But the result is that we shall be saved. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You, one, from one perspective, it's saved from hell. But you know, salvation is greater than just getting somebody out of hell. Salvation is saving them from their sins. You see, the essence of salvation is that it is a point, but it continues on. We are saved from the penalty of sin, which is hell, but then we're saved from the power of sin. And one day we'll walk into Jesus Christ's presence and we'll be saved from the presence of sin. You will be saved. My grandfather moves from Connecticut to live next door to us in Twin Falls, Idaho. It's, he's 84 years old. He's a cranky, cranky old man. I go to his house, I speak too long, too short, too loud, too soft. You know the story. He didn't want to spend time with us, instead he'd write us a $20 check. I remember every Christmas looking at that check thinking, you know what, I'd rather relationship than just money. We're all that way. You know what, my grandfather, 86, he gets so blind, he can't see, he starts to listen to books on cassette. My mom slips them in the New Testament. And as he begins to listen to the New Testament every day, guess what? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And at 86 years old, my grandfather puts his trust in Jesus Christ alone. How many think that's pretty cool? Would you raise your hand? How many of you have a loved one that you feel like it's almost impossible? You've tried to share Christ. They, they, they pushed you off. You've tried to tell them of Jesus, and they, they're not listening anymore. How many of you have somebody like that? Would you raise your hand? Can I tell you something? There is hope because the Word of God works. Do not lose hope because when the disciples came to Jesus, after the rich young, rule, uh, rich, rich young ruler came up to Jesus, and Jesus said it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven, the disciples said, well, Je- well Jesus, then, then how is it possible? Or who then can be saved? And Jesus Christ looked at the disciples and said, with man it's impossible, but with God, what? What? All things are possible. And you know, when my grandfather put his trust in Christ and his life began to change and his vocabulary changed because his heart was changed and his habits changed because his heart was changed, my life was encouraged to think that the gospel works. And some of you, you've lost hope. And some of you, have gotten discouraged. And you've thought there's no way. But with man, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. But the prerequisites of this great promise are seen. They must believe. How should they call on Him of whom they have not believed? This world has so many false gospels swirling around. This false gospel that really satisfaction comes with material possessions. The gospel of materialism. The gospel of hedonism that truly, true joy is found in the experiencing of pleasure. That's why MTV and VH1 and and, and BET, that's why those channels exist. Because they constantly, look up here. They constantly are saying that true pleasure comes when you get sex. But there are people who have slept with thousands of people, did not find Christ, and now are experiencing eternal judgment. This world has many of its false gospels going out, going out. But Jesus said, Entry at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be that go therein at, because straight is the gate, narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. You see, in this postmodern culture, it's any way you want to go. There's no absolutes. You watch a, a show, and they'll tell you that only the bad guys believe in absolutes. Can I tell you something? Jesus Christ is the only way to God. For them to be saved, they must believe. But for them to believe, they must hear. How shall they believe on Him of whom they have not heard? You see, we cannot believe something until we've heard about it. Because faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Sometimes we say, Will, where can I be evangelistic? You can be evangelistic at your workplace. You can be evangelistic just in this community. You can be evangelistic and go after some of your lost friends that you went to school with. You can be evangelistic and go after some of those that were your 
were teachers. My wife just had the privilege three weeks, four weeks ago to lead her violin teacher to the Lord. We were at a week of special meetings. This lady came. Her name is Mrs. Reno. She, is, she was petite. She was professional in her demeanor. She was high class. She came to a special evangelistic dinner that we were having. I got done preaching the gospel. She did not respond. And my wife looked at Mrs. Reno and said, Mrs. Reno, I want to spend eternity with you. Mrs. Reno, do you know for sure that you, that, that you know Jesus Christ as your Savior? And Mrs. Reno, with all of her prim and proper demeanor, she begins to weep and say, Christy, I don't know if I know Christ. And they sat down in a little room, and for the next half an hour, my wife led her through the scriptures and showed Mrs. Reno that she was a sinner, and that Mrs. Reno, though she was high class, still needed to put her trust in Jesus Christ. And right there, Mrs. Reno prayed and asked the Lord to be her Savior. And she looked up at Christy with tears coming down her face and said, I feel like I just got set up. She said, two years ago, a a composer that I was working with came by and he shared Christ with me. And he gave me a little piece of paper, a little pamphlet that had Bible verses in it. And I read it and right then I thought I should be saved. She said a couple months ago, I opened my Bible and that pamphlet fell out and I read it again and I knew I should be saved. She said, your husband was preaching tonight and I I just knew I should be saved. But when you asked me, I just couldn't put it off any longer. How do they believe except they hear? There was a kid that came to camp, one of the camps I was preaching at. He had swear words written all over his arms. He dressed total goth. He wasn't just a a wannabe. He, He was a goth kid. And so here he is. He's just dressed up in Kirk was angry at everything. He was swearing up and down the counselors. He was trying to sneak around, find music. Finally, we almost had to let him go back home, but I, I, I said, let's wait one more day, and I pulled him in the office, and I was getting ready to talk to him, and he said he didn't believe in the Bible. He didn't believe in, in uh, heaven, hell. He didn't believe in God. And so as I'm walking in, somebody just said a phrase to me. They said, don't prove the sword, use the sword. It's a quote by Charles Spurgeon. They didn't even know I was going to talk to Kurt. They just happened to say, I just heard a quote. Don't prove the sword, use the sword. And I sat down with Kurt, and I began to have him. And I said, since you don't believe in the Bible, since you don't believe in God, there's nothing to be afraid of. You don't, you, you don't need to be afraid of this if you don't believe in it. So why don't you just read some of the verses that I want you to read. And then for the next 40 minutes, we just read through a bunch of the scriptures. I started in Genesis 3 and how the advent of sin. And I took them to Isaiah and showed them how uh, Satan uh, rebelled against God. I took them to Roman, uh, Revelation and showed them what the end of Satan is. I, I took them to Exodus, made them read the law. I took them to Romans 3 and told them how we'd all broken the law. I took them to Romans 5 and so that Jesus Christ died for us. And he looked at me after about 40 minutes and said, can we be done? And I said, sure. It's Friday. He leaves. He leaves Saturday. We get a phone call from his youth pastor on Monday. And his youth pastor said, Will, the first person down the aisle Sunday morning was Kurt. He took pastor's hand and he said, I need to be saved right now. He said, I can't get all those verses out of my head. Don't prove the sword. Use the sword. It's time for some of you to take out that rusty sword and start wielding it. It's time for you to take it out and start sharing it, whether it goes out in gospel tracts, whether it goes out in two-minute gospel presentations, whether it goes out in your life. You see, they must believe, but for them to believe, they must hear. But for them to hear, we must preach. For how should they hear except there be a preacher, somebody to herald the story, somebody just to proclaim it. Somebody just to shout it. It's the whole idea of a preacher is somebody who's standing on a hilltop and they're heralding the king that's coming behind them and they're saying it's true. The king is coming. The king is coming. The king is coming. Specifically, it could be one that's called into full-time Christian ministry. But whether it's full-time Christian ministry or you're just a full-time Christian, we are all called to preach. Your mouth is to preach. You're to be light. Your life is to preach. You are to be salt. Know your story. Know the Scriptures. And know your Savior. Do you know why many of us cannot share Christ with others? Because our testimony is so foggy. remember coming home. My first summer from Christmas, or my, my first Christmas, I got home and one of my best friends, he went down to Salt Lake for a Grateful Dead concert. 
he came back with a bunch of LSD because hippies follow the Grateful Dead. He comes back to the Twin Falls, Idaho. He'd been on a three-month high. He'd alternate LSD and marijuana because it gave him a longer high. And I looked at him. I couldn't figure out what his problem was. He had a cousin who's lost, unsaved. His cousin to me was talking about the scriptures and finally said, I don't know why I should be saved. Look at my cousin. You know what? Some of us, we claim Christ's name. But we don't live like Christ. I had one man, he said, I like Jesus Christ. I just don't like his followers. Could it be why you have no gospel witness? Is because your cousin knows how that you're being immoral? Could it be why there's no gospel witness? Is because you sat down and watched the porn? Could it be that there's no gospel witness? Is because you're bitter at your parents? You're so self-focused that you have no concern for others. We must preach. But to preach, there must be a life of walking with Jesus Christ. We can come up with excuses why we don't share Christ. We can say, I don't know what to say. Yet, if we wanted to know, we'd figure it out. We can say, I'm just so scared. But God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Will, I, I'm just, I just don't know. Let's just be honest. The reason why we do not share Christ is because there's a distance from the heart of God. William Burns, one of my heroes, a Scottish evangelist, as a boy, he's 17 years old, he goes to the big city of Glasgow, and his mom can't find him, and finally she finds him. He's in an alleyway, and he's got his hands over his face, and he's weeping, and she says, what's the matter? And he said, the thud of these Christless feet on their way to hell deafens my ears. William Burns, he spent the rest of his life just serving God in China, and he dies, and they put it on his tombstone, the man of the book. Hudson Taylor walked up to a Chinaman and said, Do you know William Burns? He said, No, William Burns. All of China knows he's the holiest man alive. You see, the greatest thing that you could do to prep your soul in sharing Christ is that you'd walk with God. Because sharing Christ, it's not just a mental exercise. It's the overflow of the heart. You see, I could sit down with somebody and I could tell them truths, but without the power of God, it would do nothing. Because salvation is not just a mental acquiescence to a bunch of facts. It's a heart submission to the will and the way of God. It's God doing a work in the hearts of man. We need the power of God in our life. We must preach, and therefore we must go. How should I preach except they be sent? Do you realize we've all been called? Do you realize that whether or not we're called in to be a preacher, an evangelist, or a teacher, or whatever we say in full-time service, that we are all called to be full-time Christians? My father-in-law is a doctor in Denver, and you know, he's not a perfect man, but he sure loves God. You get on the phone with him, and in a few minutes, he's talking about God. He's talking about a book he read. He's talking about something that's the Bible. He's constantly looking for somebody to share Christ with. Do you realize that whether or not you're called to full-time ministry, you are called to be a full-time Christian? There's some of you men... That that you are want to so badly. You've got it in your heart. In fact, I think it's from God. You want to be a businessman. You want to be in marketing. You want to be in sales. And you know it's the will of God. Well, do the will of God, but go and use it as an opportunity to share Christ. It's not two worlds. It's not God world and business world. It's God's world. And one, uh, one uh, my, guy my age... He, went, he worked for Deloitte. He's an accountant. But you know what he is? He's a lay youth pastor in Nashville, Tennessee. And he does his 40 to 50 hours, and then he runs youth activities for the church, and he teaches a, a, a Sunday school. This church of 120, guess what? They don't have enough money to pay a full-time youth pastor. But this man and his wife, they stood in the gap, and it could be that you, you want to be in marketing. You want to be in graphic design. It could be that God wants to be an interior decorator. I don't know what God wants for you, but this I know from the Word that all of us are called to take the gospel to the lost. Amen? And I grew up in Idaho, 40% Mormon in my town. Three hours away, there's towns of 97% Mormon, 98% Mormon. And there's church planners all up and down. I'm going to be with three church planners. And we're going to park for a couple weeks. And we're going to do all sorts of evangelistic events. You know what those church planners need? They need you! 
to get married to that one you love, and then you guys go get three years, and you get a job in that town of Boise, Idaho, Pocatello, Idaho, Salt Lake City, and you get a job, and you park in that church, and you become a faithful deacon, and you find a place to serve, and you bring lost people in this, in the, into the church. God could use you, and He wants to use you, but it's time to go. You're not at this college to just get facts. You're at this college to walk with God because evangelism is not just a presentation. Evangelism is the overflow of your life. Father, help us today. Lord, to get pushed more and more to know Christ, to share Christ. With their heads bound, who'd say will. God just keeps on pouring on the fuel about me sharing Christ with those people I wrote down on my paper. Brother Will, I want, I'm going to pray for them again in this chapel time that they'd be saved. If that's you, would you raise your hand and say, Will, I'm thinking of people that need to be saved and I'm going to pray for them. Would you just put your hand up? Put your hands down. I wonder how many of you would say, Will, I've never decided this before, but I'm really wrestling about full-time ministry. I've never surrendered to this or maybe surrendered to it, to it as a child. And you've drifted and you're really wrestling with it. If that's you, would you raise your hand and you say, Will, I've never surrendered to that or I'm wrestling with it. Full-time ministry. Would you pray for me? Would you just lift your hand straight up? Okay. Put your hands down. I want to say, Will, I believe God's called me into some form of life that's not full-time ministry. But I believe God is stirring up my heart about availing my gifts to a local church or a church plant or something in ministry. If that's you, would you raise your hand? Let's pray right now. Father, I pray that you would use your word. I pray for the student body that, Lord, 50% would be very diligent to share Christ with somebody on this list in the next three weeks. I pray specifically, Lord, for the hundred people that raised their hands, something about ministry, that, Lord, that you would not let them go by the wayside, but they'd be earnest about finding a way to plug into a church plant or a church. In Jesus' name, amen.